So I got a funny story. I was, uh, I was prepping, I was studying for today's sermon, and I always go to this little coffee shop, and it's up in like our Sky Canyon Community Center. And so when I, uh, I don't live in Sky Canyon, but I get to go to the community center. I pretend like I live up there. But as I was studying, when I study, I, I kind of walk and I pace. A lot of you guys know I kind of walk around a lot, right? So I'm walking, I'm pacing, and I just kind of talk to myself, and I just kind of go through things and run through things. And I had probably been doing this a couple hours, and this sweet little lady comes up to me. She goes, sir? I said, yeah. She said, can I ask you a question? I said, yeah. She goes, I'm a sales manager. Are you in sales? Are you like s- s- prepping for a presentation? I was like, no. I was like, I'm actually, I'm preaching tomorrow, so I'm just prepping for my, my sermon. She's like, oh, good. She's like, I've been watching you walk around here for hours <laughs> just talking to yourself. And she's like, I'm looking at you. And I'm like, you don't look crazy. But she's like, I'm starting to wonder. I said, no, 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 no. I assure you I am not crazy. It is just how I do it. So if you're new, if you haven't been here, if you're visiting, my name is Sean, and I assure you I am not crazy. But you will see me walk around and move around a lot. So anyway, we are continuing our series entitled Cornerstone Values. And if you guys don't mind, can we kind of just jump right into scripture? Is that good? All right, I'm going to just jump right in. So if you have your Bibles, I hope that you do, please open them up. We're going to be in the book of Matthew chapter 5. If you've got your phones, open those up. Go to Matthew chapter 5. Verse 1, it says, Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Would it be a fair statement to say, I don't think this is too bold in saying it, but we all want to live our life with and experience more of God's blessing. We all want to experience more of his favor, more of his presence, more of his peace in our life, right? We all want to be blessed in our relationships, we want to be blessed in our businesses, we want to be blessed in our churches. We want to be blessed in our life. We want to be blessed in our death. We want to be blessed in eternity, don't we? But many professing Christians, they kind of stall out. They they stop growing in their walk with God and they settle for the little that they do have. They kind of reconcile themselves to stay where they're at to stop maturing in their faith, to stop growing in their walk with God. And they never fully live in all the blessings that God has for us. Well, that's not me, and I don't think that's you, is it? And I know it's not this Cornerstone Church family. We want to be a people, we want to be a church that walk in all the blessings that God has for our lives. We want to be a people, we want to be a church that know and enjoy his favor and his peace and his presence in our life. We want to be a people, we want to be a church that can say with King David that our cups overflow. But what is a blessed life? How do we begin to move in that direction? Where do we start? We start with Jesus. We always start with Jesus.
as we're going through this series, Cornerstone Values, one of the first and overarching values of this church is Jesus is in everything and Jesus is everything. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the Alpha, the Omega. Jesus is the beginning and the end. Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith. Jesus is the name above all names. Jesus is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Jesus is the one in which all authority has been given to and the one in which every knee will bow. And Jesus tells us if we would just fix our eyes on him, if we would just seek him, if we would seek his kingdom, what is a value of Jesus, if we would seek his righteousness, his right way of living, that all these things, all these blessings would be given unto us. Ephesians 1 tells us that when we are united with Christ, that God blesses us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. You want to know how to live a spirit, uh, a blessed life? It comes from th- submitting to the kingship, lordship of Jesus Christ. So if we want to experience the blessing of God, we look to Jesus. Because nobody knows where to find the blessings of God more than him. And so in Matthew chapter 5, when Jesus begins to teach us what a blessed life looks like, I know I want to listen. I think you want to listen, right? I think we should all want to listen. But before we kind of jump into today's character, today's value, today's beatitude, I just want to touch on a couple things in regard to the beatitudes. And I want to just look at three ways in which we should look at the beatitudes. First, they are a code of ethics, if you will. For Jesus' disciples. They're kind of a standard of conduct for all believers. In essence, they're, they show us how we should live and what is of value in the kingdom of God. I love this verse. Colossians 1, 13, 14 says, we have been rescued from the kingdom of darkness and we have been transferred in to the kingdom of the son who he loves, who purchased our freedom, and forgave us our sins. Do we hear that, church? Jesus Christ purchased our freedom with his death on the cross so that we could be transferred from the kingdom of darkness and brought in to his kingdom. We are no longer citizens of this world, but we are citizens of where? Citizens is heaven. And as citizens of heaven, as kingdom people, We should live life different. We should live life to a different set of standards and values. And that's what Jesus breaks down for us in the Beatitudes. Number two, the Beatitudes, they contrast kingdom values, what is eternal, with worldly values, what is temporary. Kingdom values, they're often very counterintuitive. You might even say the kingdom values are a little bit upside down when we compare them to the values of the world the world would say this blessed are the strong or the powerful are those with resources blessed are those who are self-sufficient and get things done on their own but jesus says blessed are the poor blessed are those who don't have resources blessed are those who understand their complete dependence on God. Jesus talks about a kind of poverty that will make us rich. The world, or Jesus talks about blessed are those who mourn. He's talking about blessings for those who are sad and for those who grieve. Now, is that on anybody's wish list? Mourning and sadness and grief. But Jesus, he talks about a kind of mourning a kind of sadness, a kind of grief that leads to great joy. Number three, the Beatitudes describe what a true follower of Christ looks like. Can we say it this way? They describe what a true Christian looks like. 
And I want to ask this question. I just want to stop here for a second. How do we recognize, how do you recognize a true Christian, a true follower of Christ? Is it somebody who believes? It's not a bad answer, right? There are truths in Scripture that God reveals to us that unless we believe them, we cannot be a Christian. Jesus himself says in John 8, verse 24, he says, Unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. In John chapter 6, verse 29, some disciples, they, they come up to Jesus and they say, Jesus, Jesus, what must we do to do the work God requires? Jesus' reply was this. He says, the work of God is this. Believe in the one he sent. But if we explore a little further, we also see in the book of James that even the demons believe. The gospel of Mark chapter 1 says that it was a demon who was the first to declare and proclaim that Jesus was the Holy One of God. Here's the truth, church. Satan knows who Jesus is. Satan knew what, knows what he came to do, but Satan refuses to submit to the kingship and the lordship of Jesus Christ. And he walks around life as a self-crowned king and lord of his own life. You might say, Hey, we identify a Christian by the things they do. Their good works, their good deeds. Again, not a bad answer, right? Book of James again tells us what? Faith without works is, right? Jesus tells us, he says, every man that hears my words and what? Does them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. But we also see Jesus say to some people that did some pretty good works, some folks that perform miracles, cast out demons, prophesize. He says to them, he says, I never knew you. Depart from me, away from me, you evildoers. Here's the truth. Us going to church, us reading our Bibles, us doing our quiet time every morning, us giving, us serving on Sunday doesn't make us a true follower of Christ. To get personal... Me being up here on a Sunday doesn't make me a true follower of Christ. But Jesus, he lays out for us in the Beatitudes what a true follower of Christ is. And a true follower of Christ is somebody that understands their need and their dependence on God and trust in Christ and Christ alone for their salvation. A true Christian understands and mourns and grieves over their sin in a way that leads to what? Leads to repentance. Leads us to turn back to God. A true Christian meekly and humbly submits to the Lord. A true Christian hungers and thirsts for righteousness. This means they, they crave relationship and fellowship with God above anything else. They look for right relationships, not only with God, but with one another. A true Christian's merciful, pure of heart, and they seek to be agents of peace. A true Christian endures persecution. For Jesus tells us it's the one that endures to the end that will be saved. A true Christian never turns his back on Jesus. A true Christian endures to the end. Two quick points I just want to touch on with the Beatitudes again. So, the Beatitudes, they describe, where are we at? They describe what a true Christian looks like, but they do not describe how we become a Christian. This is super important when understanding the teaching of God or teaching of Jesus here. A true Christian is recognized by these distinguishing marks laid out in the Beatitudes. But remember, these are evidence of a new life in Christ. They are not the cause of a new life in Christ. Jesus isn't saying that if or when you become poor in spirit, if or when you mourn over your sin, if or when 
you hunger for righteousness, then you will be saved. No. That is salvation by works, and that is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches clear that, that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. But a true fa saving faith, a true saving faith, never acts alone. Because when we taste the goodness of God's salvation, we taste the sweetness of his love, of his mercy, of his forgiveness, and of his grace. It should always produce spiritual fruit in our lives. The Beatitudes are the fruit of a new life in Christ Jesus. Second thing, we cannot produce these things, these fruits, these character traits, on our own. Now, I don't know if you guys ever do. I do this. I'm guilty of this sometimes. But do you ever look at the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5? And like, kind of like a checklist or a to-do list for the day? You're like, all right. John, I'm getting ready. You're going to be lo more loving. You're going to be more patient. You're going to be more kind. You're going to be more gentle. Then one of my kids interrupts me. and I'm like, hold on, I'm thinking. Got my to-do list going. Start driving to work. Five minutes in, you're yelling at somebody, right? We can't produce these things on our own. The fruits of the Spirit, these, these character traits, these are only produced by a deep, abiding relationship with Jesus. John 15, 5 says this, if you remain in me, if you abide in me and I in you, you will produce much fruit. But apart from, apart from me, you can do nothing. I love that word abide. Sounds a little churchy, doesn't it? Really what it means is, it means to make your home in. It means to spend time with Jesus. Spend time with him in prayer. Spend time with him in God's word. Spend time with him in worship. And spend time with God's people. His church. If you want to produce this kind of fruit in your life, we have to be in a deep and abiding relationship with Jesus. So, with all that being said, we're going to go take a look at the third beatitude, the third marker of a true Christian. Meekness. Matthew 5, 5 says, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. So here's kind of the rundown, the outline of what I want to do. So first we're going to define meekness. And then we're going to look at some characteristics of somebody who's meek, of a person who's meek. And then I want to look at some ways in which we can grow in meekness and cultivate meekness. Are we ready? Does that sound like a good plan? All right. What exactly does it mean to be meek? And I suppose the question of the day, and it was the title of the sermon, I don't think I have it up there, but is meekness weakness? No. Sermon over. Cool. No, I'm kidding. I was getting kind of dry mouth anyway, so it works out perfect. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so if you were to do like a quick Google search, though, of the word meek or meekness, Webster's Dictionary would define it as deficient in spirit and in courage. That sounds a little bit weak, doesn't it? The, the how to use in a sentence example they give you, which, by the way, this one's not very creative, but this is the one they use. It says, all his best friends made fun of him for his meekness. I'm like, you couldn't have done better than that. Come on. Um, but that definitely gives a negative idea of the word meek, right? But Jesus is super clear that he says, what, blessed are the meek, right? For they will inherit the earth. Jesus deeply valued meekness. So what comes to mind maybe when you hear the word meek? Is it a meek person, maybe somebody that's soft-spoken? Maybe we think of a meek person as somebody that doesn't stand up for themselves, somebody with, uh, you know, without a spine. Maybe somebody that's a little bit soft on righteousness. Maybe a meek person, somebody that just kind of goes along to get along as to not cause any friction. You know, like a pushover or a doormat. If we're being really honest, I mean, in our culture, we wouldn't really define a dynamic leader or a great coach or a good boss as meek, would we? It's not usually a word we use. 
And I think if we were like really being honest, if somebody came up to you and was like, you know what, Sean, dude, you're super meek. I'd be like, what? I'm like, I'm meek? You're meek, bro. Come on. Or if I was in a job interview, right, and I'm trying to sell myself, and so I'm listing off all my character traits, right? I'm like, you know, I'm passionate, I'm, I'm dedicated, I'm hardworking, I'm, I never give up. I know Word and Excel. I'm just kidding. But, and you know what else? I'm really meek. Like, super meek. Like, I am the meekest person you've ever met. My guess isn't the interviewer's not going to look at you and be like, dude, we've been looking for somebody meek. Welcome to the team. I think one of the reasons we connect meekness and weakness together is they sound a whole lot similar, right? Meekness, weakness, they rhyme. Even when I was writing this sermon, and if you're taking notes, you can put this down, I'm a terrible speller. I'm also really bad at geography, just in case you're listing out my gaps in knowledge. So, don't ask me where a city is on the map, and please don't ask me to spell it. I get really nervous if I have to spell it in front of people. But while I was writing the sermon, I kept spelling meek like you would weak. M-E-A-K. And then I started spelling weak like you would meek. W-E-E-K. It was a mess. I had to keep hitting the red little squiggly button and fixing it. I did it in the entire sermon. But meekness, guys, meekness, and you guys already nailed it, so you're ahead of the game. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is strength under control. And I don't just mean self-control, like being able to bite your tongue when somebody says something to you. Although, that is part of meekness. But meekness is about a strength under the control of God. It's strength that is in submission to God. Now take a look at that word submission, right? You've got sub, which means under, and you've got mission. So in essence, meekness is strength under the mission of God. The Greek word here, it, it describes this, this necessary and needed balance between exercising our strength, our power, and our authority while avoiding harshness. Really, it's about strength, but treating people gently and humbly and patiently. This word was often used in, in, in regard to domesticating animals. So think of like a circus or a zoo, right? You got some of the strongest, most powerful, most fierce animals in the world. You've got lions, you've got tigers, you've got... I had to throw a PG joke in there, so we love you, Pastor Greg. But when a, when a trainer trains those animals, tames those animals, they do not strip those animals of their power or their strength. Rather, they teach them restraint. They teach them to contain that strength. You see, those animals, at any time they want, they can demonstrate and display their strength. But they've learned restraint. They've learned balance. They've learned when to use that strength, when to use that power and authority, and when not to. Think about a, a, a horse that hasn't been broken yet, right? That horse hasn't learned restraint, so if somebody were going to come up to that horse and try to ride it or try to lead it or try to guide it, that horse would what? It would kick and it would buck. That horse would resist the bit and bridle. The very devices that are designed to govern that horse, lead that horse, guide that horse. That horse's strength, that horse's power, it is, uh, it is out of control. But once that horse learns... To submit to that bit and bridle. To submit to the device that was designed to govern it and lead it. It'll stop kicking. It'll stop bucking. And it'll be at peace. See, that horse will learn to come under the control, under the submission of the rider. And that rider will be able to lead and guide and direct and govern that horse. That is a picture of meekness. It is us taking our strength, putting it under the control of God, so he can begin to lead us and guide us 
and govern our lives. The truth is, guys, in our fallen nature, in our sinful nature, we are all just a bunch of wild animals. We refuse sometimes to submit to the bit and bridle of God's hand. We refuse to submit to his leading and his guiding and the governance over our lives. We sometimes refuse to submit to his word and to his will. Now, when I say we're all a bunch of animals, I kind of say that tongue-in-cheek. I kind of say that jokingly. But that's kind of how the Bible describes us. Jeremiah chapter 2 Jeremiah, he's rebuking the people of God. Essentially, he's rebuking them for stepping out on God. They're not listening to God. They're not obeying God's law. They're worshiping other gods. And he describes them. He says, you guys are like a bunch of wild donkeys and restless camels. Write that one down. No. <laughs> Romans 8, 7 says this. The mind governed by the flesh or governed by the sinful nature, is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's word, nor can it even do so. Those who are in this realm, in the realm of the sinful nature, cannot please God. This is why Jesus tells Nicodemus that unless you're born again, unless you're born of the Spirit, unless God cuts away that sinful nature... We can't inherit the kingdom of God. God has created each and every one of us in his image. God has given us the ability to love, to reason, to think, to be creative, to create, to cultivate his good creation. God's given us all strength. He's given us power. God's given us spiritual gifts. He's given us talents. He's given us skills. He's given us resources but unless we submit those things to God, unless we submit our strength to God, unless we come under his control, we will use those gifts, we will use those strengths in a way that is at best unproductive and at worst just flat out chaotic and destructive. Think about the Hoover Dam. It supplies power for Nevada, California, Arizona. Remember, don't ask me to spell those, but that's, that's what it is. The Hoover Dam, it's a, it's, a, it's a power under control, right? But if you were to loosen that water, if you were to break that dam, there would be chaos and destruction in all the areas that it was designed to help. Strength and power that are not in control, that are out of control, always leads to chaos and destruction. But when we bring our sinful nature under the control and governance of God, when we accept his bit and bridle and allow him to lead us, to guide us, our strength will become harnessed and directed and we will begin to experience the peace and the blessing of God because we are walking in accordance with to his word, and to his will. You see, we'll no longer be like that horse that's kicking and bucking and resisting, but we'll be fully submitted to God, and then we'll be able to begin to experience his blessings and his peace in our life. So what are some characteristics of someone that's meek? And I just wrote some things down. A meek person's characterized... A person characterized by meekness is humble, gentle, they're patient, forgiving, content. A pe person who's meek is submitted to the word of God, to the will of God, and to God's people. You see, God uses meekness to deliver us from things like pride, from harshness, from aggression, from vengeance. So that we can better show love, mercy, compassion, forgiveness, and patience to others. I got a quote here from a really awesome pastor that you guys all know very well. 
and I think we have it on the, if you put it on the notes, but Pastor Greg said this about meekness. I think he said he wrote this in like 99, 2000. So he says, a meek person is someone who has a true and healthy estimation of themselves and sees themselves as human beings with no special claims to status, power, or strength. And because of their understanding of who they are, they are able to treat people in the appropriate manner, gently, kindly, and considerately. Yes, thank you, PG. As you know, this series is entitled Cornerstone Values, and we've spent the last few weeks looking at the words of Jesus and what he values to begin to determine what this church values, what this church is going to be about. And Joey's laid out two of them for us. Now, these, the, the wording might change here a little bit, but this is the heart of Pastor Joey. This is the heart of this Cornerstone Church. And the first one is, we're going to be a church that's about Jesus. Number one is, Jesus is in everything, and Jesus is everything. We are going to be a people in a church that preach the name of Jesus. <laughs> Number two. And I like this one. It says, we grow better to what? We grow better together. In order for us to grow together, to do this Christian walk together, it is so important that we cultivate a, a spirit of meekness, a spirit of gentleness and patience and humility towards one another. It's so important that we give room for each other's faults and we avoid harshness and we always respond with the love of christ the love of christ is this the love of christ is a self-sacrificing love that humbly puts others before themselves philippians 2 3 and 4 says do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit but rather in humility Value others before yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. That right there, guys, is a picture of meekness. So how do we begin to cultivate meekness? How do we begin to grow in meekness? Number one, and we kind of touched on this, but we walk daily, we walk in daily fellowship with Jesus. Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 says, take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart. Some translations use the word meek. So if you still weren't convinced that meekness isn't weakness, Jesus is one of two people in the Bible described as meek. You know who the other one was? Moses. So meekness, guys, is not weakness. He says, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. You see, Jesus, he's, he's humble. He's gentle. In other words, Jesus is meek. And Jesus tells us that, that we would yoke ourselves to him, that he will teach us to be humble and gentle and meek. A yoke is a device that binds two animals together so that they can walk side by side so what jesus is saying he's saying bind yourselves to me walk with me do life with me let me teach you learn from me none of us in our, in our in naturally are meek but jesus is saying is if you would just bind yourself to me if you would come alongside with me if you would walk with me i will teach you how to be meek and I love what he says about meekness, because we already talked about meekness, right? Submitting to God leads to what? It leads to peace. Jesus says the same thing. He says, when you learn to be humble, when you learn to be gentle, you will find what? You will find rest for your souls. So what can we do this week to spend more time with Jesus? It's not a real hard question, but I encourage you just to think about that. Where can we... Loosen things up in our schedule. Where can we prioritize our daily time with Jesus? Number two, make friends with meek people. 
Proverbs 22, 24 through 25 says this. Don't befriend angry people or associate with hot-tempered people or you will learn to be like them and endanger your soul. Hmm. Do you know the Bible tells us not to make friends with people that are habitually and continually angry? It's a direct command from God. Why do you think he says this? It will endanger your soul. The principle is this. And you guys have all heard this phrase. Birds of a feather, right? So just like point number one, when we spend time with Jesus, when we walk with Jesus, we begin to reflect Jesus' character, right? Well, it's the same thing with the people we hang with. The more and more and the longer we hang with certain individuals, we eventually begin to reflect their character. We've all experienced this, right? You've been around somebody that's like just constantly complaining, constantly negative, constantly angry, right? And then all of a sudden you kind of start to find yourself like joining in on the fun, or should I say kind of joining in on the misery. Misery loves company. So the longer we tend to do that, we begin to reflect their character and their image. Now, hear me, does not mean that we just like never hang out with these kind of people, right? They're the people that need the love of Christ, right? We are called to share the good news with what, just people we like? No, we're called to share it with everybody. But what it does mean is that we should be mindful on the people that we're spending our most time with. We should be mindful of our inner circle we should be mindful, and I think the term they use today of our, our tribe, those people we do life with the most, right? We should be not hanging out with people that are just given over to anger all the time, but people that are cultivating and growing in a spirit of meekness, in a spirit of gentleness and humility. Now, I wanted to ask this kind of like deep question, right, and say, are there some relationships in your life that you need to begin to rethink and maybe there is but here's the question i actually want to ask are we sometimes that friend who's constantly negative who's constantly angry who's constantly complaining i've found myself in those kind of seasons i'm like dude what is wrong with you and pastor greg he had a pretty bold word and it hit me he said if we're not experiencing the joy of the lord we might not be f as filled with the Holy Spirit as we think we are. That got me thinking. So if that's you today, if you find yourself in that kind of season, where you just feel a little angry, you feel a little sharp tongue, you feel a little curt with people, I want to redirect you back to point one. Because we can't, Display the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, forgiveness, patience, self-control. Unless we are in a deep, abiding relationship with Jesus. So if you're not experiencing the joy of the Lord, I'm going to go out on a limb and say you're not spending enough time with Jesus. Number three. We grow in meekness, first by spending time with Jesus, second by spending time with meek people. Third, find joy in the evidence of God's grace. Philippians 4a, I love this verse. It says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. One of the best ways to overcome frustration, anger, disappointment within ourselves or maybe with others is to think about things that are lovely, that are praiseworthy, that are admirable, and that are excellent. Like the grace of God, not only in our lives, but in the lives of other people. I think sometimes we can get angry with other Christians because we just don't think they're growing fast enough in their walk. Sometimes we're angry because we're like, they're just not maturing enough in their faith. We can say things like, man, how 
only been a Christian, they should know better. Right? Or man, they say they love Jesus. How could they say something like that? How could they do something like that? Bottom line, sometimes as Christians, as believers, we can be pretty harsh on one another, can't we? And harshness, guys, is the opposite of meekness. Harshness is the opposite of patience and humility and treating people gently. But what if we thought, and what if we looked at our Christian life, our spiritual walk, like that of a new housing development? Think about this, right? You've got all these different houses, right? And they're in different stages of development, right? So you've got some houses, the walls are up, the roof is forming, and you can already imagine what it's going to be like to live in that house, right? And you think to yourself, oh man, this is going to be great. Then you've got other houses, and it's just a big muddy hole. And you're thinking to yourself, you're like, is that house ever going to amount to anything? And as Christians, we're all in different stages of development. Some of us, you can already see the shape and the form of the reflection of Jesus, and you're like, man, that's awesome. And at that, we should rejoice, right? Then you got others where the Holy Spirit's just beginning his work. And you might look at them, and they just look like a big, muddy hole. But hey, there's a hole, isn't there? The Holy Spirit's begun to work in that individual. And we should rejoice in that as well. We need to remember when looking at others that any evidence of faith, of hope, of love is the work of the Holy Spirit and that we should find great joy you see, we're all unfinished houses. None of us is what we are going to one day be. But God promises that he is going to complete the good and perfect work that he has started in each and every one of us. So if you want to grow in meekness, if you want to be more gentle and patient and loving, let us reflect and take joy in the everyday evidence of God's grace in other people's lives. Number three, four. We're on four. All right. We're cruising along. I think I'm good on time. All right. Remember that we are all saved and forgiven sinners. Second Peter 1 9 says this. It says, But those who fail to develop in this way are short sighted or blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their old sins. If you were to go back to verses 6 and 7, Peter says those who are walking with Jesus should display self-control, steadfastness, and love. Remember, meekness is about love and self-control or strength under control, right? He says those who do not display this kind of life, they must have forgotten or they must be blind to the truth that Jesus has cleansed them of their sins and forgiven them of their sins. So it goes as follows. If we remember that we have been loved much and forgiven much, we will begin to grow in meekness. We will begin to grow in patience. We'll begin to grow in love for others. I want to ask you this question. If God was as hard as if God was as hard on us every time we sin, every time we mess up, every time we fall short, as we are on other people, we can be so hard on other people. And it is so important that we just look at others, first realizing that, yes, we're all unfinished houses, that God is in the process of sanctifying us or making him, us more like Christ. But above all, let us remember that each and every one of us has been forgiven for all of our sins, for all of our shortcomings, for all of our faults. And let's be a people in a church that extend that to others. Last point. Yeah, I thought I was going to go over. All right. 
This point's super simple, but I think we forget this a lot. If we want to grow in meekness, point number five, if we want to grow in meekness, you guys ready? Throw it up there. Ask God. That's pretty simple, right? We want to grow in meekness. Just ask. Is God not a good father who wants to give good gifts to his children? Think about it for a second. Do we really think that if we were to ask God, God, make me more meek, make me more gentle, make me more patient, make me more loving, help me to just not get so upset at other people's fault. Do you really think he's going to rebuke us and say no? Think about with Solomon, right? God was super pleased with Solomon when he asked for more wisdom rather than a longer life and wealth, right? James 1.5 says this, If you need wisdom, ask our generous, our generous God. And what does it say? It says, and he will, right? He will give it to you. You know what he won't do? He will not rebuke you for asking. And in James 3.17, it says this about the type of wisdom that God gives us. Hear this. It says, but the wisdom from above is first of all pure. It is also peace-loving, gentle at, at all times, and willing to yield to others. The wisdom that God gives us, it sounds a whole lot like what? meekness doesn't it it's gentle it's loving it's willing to yield to others guys if we ask god to help us grow in meekness if we ask him to be more patient more gentle more forgiving more humble the bible tells us he'll say yes so that's how i want to close today i just want to come before god and just humbly ask that he gives me a spirit of meekness and he gives his church a spirit of meekness because in order for us to walk in obedience to what God's calling us all to do in order to be a people that go out and share the good news share the gospel not only with our word but with our deeds by caring for others loving others we need to be a people that are meek we need to be a people that are fully submitted to God, we need to be a people that are about Jesus, that are submitted to his word, to his will, and to his people. We need to be a people that can share the love of Christ. Christ was meek, and he calls us to be a meek. Can we just bow our heads, and I'll close us out here in prayer. Dear Lord, we come to you Full of thankfulness, Lord. Full of gratitude for your love, Lord. For your grace, for your mercy, and for your forgiveness, Lord. Lord, your words tell us that a spirit of meekness, Lord. A spirit of gentleness, Lord. A spirit of patience and humility is of great worth. It's of great value in the kingdom of God. We recognize that we are not citizens of this world, but we are inhabitants of your kingdom, Lord. Lord, and we come to you as children, your children, knowing and believing that you're a good father, Lord. You're a good dad. And you just love to give good gifts to your children, Lord. We thank you for that. And we ask that you fill us, Lord. Fill us with your spirit. Help us to grow in meekness, Lord. Give us a spirit that's more loving, Lord. A spirit that's more patient, that's more kind. More gentle with others, Lord. Lord, we just ask that you just help us to, to tame our sinful natures. Tame our tongues in order that we can speak life. We can speak your love into other people rather than tearing people down help us to keep from making rash and harsh judgments about others reminding us daily of your sacrifice on the cross 
reminding us daily that we are loved much and forgiven much. Help us to see the best in others, Lord. Help us to see that each and every one of us is made in your wonderful and glorious image. Let us see people the way you see us, Lord. Help us to continually see your grace in our lives, Lord. Help us to see the grace you bestowed upon others in their lives, Lord. Help us when we're facing difficult situations, Lord, when we're feeling persecuted, when we're, we're going through trials and troubles, Lord, when we're, when we're facing hardships and we're in sickness, Lord, and financial issues, whatever the case is, Lord. Help us and just fill us with your joy, Lord. Help us to continually find joy in your salvation, Lord. Draw us close to you, Lord. Draw us close. Bring us into your presence, Lord. Fill us with your spirit, Lord. Help us to grow in meekness. Help us to be more humble and gentle. Help us to reflect the image of your son, Lord. In Jesus' precious name we pray.